how um, the various federal EEO enforcement agencies would go about their job. Um, before that surprise night, uh, many of us were protecting essentially a continuation of what we had seen in the previous eight years under the Obama administration. Um, but with that election, we obviously had to rethink quite a bit. And so what uh, we're going to share with you today uh, are some of those thoughts, insights, perhaps predictions. We'll, uh, we'll dust out the crystal ball and, and see what that tells us. Um, and then as mentioned, uh, we'll do our best to respond to any specific questions that you have. Um, okay, so just real quick in terms of our agenda, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, context and background. In other words, uh, you know, what uh, we saw in the previous eight years of the Obama administration versus uh, what candidate and now President Trump talked about. Uh, in terms of regulatory posture. We're going to examine um, both the, the two principal EEO enforcement agencies, uh, the EEOC and the OFCCP, in terms of their enforcement priorities. Uh, and then we're going to deal with some very specific regulatory changes that took place in the previous administration and discuss uh, not only what those changes, uh, what those regulations were, but what, if anything, we expect to change about them uh, now that we have a new uh, and different uh, administration. Okay, um, so just real quick, uh, here's my lawyer's disclaimer. Uh, please understand that this information is just that. It's informational. Um, it is meant for educational purposes and not meant to be specific legal advice. So if you do have any specific issues um, that you would like addressed, obviously you can always reach out to me uh, or you can reach out to the normal employment council with which you work. Um, but this is supposed to be more general topic and discussion. Um, I won't, uh, given the nature of the amount of time we have, talk to you about uh, the firm, Jackson Lewis, of which I am a part. Um, and uh, Rathin already spoke about uh, who I am um, and specifically how I am the co-chair of Jackson Lewis's Affirmative Action and OFCCP Defense Practice Group. Um, whereby um, or wherein I uh, oversee the preparation of, uh, as mentioned, a thousand affirmative action plans and uh, oftentimes hundreds of OCCP audits in a given year. So, so we're pretty close to um, what goes on at the EEO enforcement agencies, and hopefully I'll be able to share with you um, some of that experience. Okay, so. The big question is, is what should we be expecting uh, from the Trump administration um, when it comes to uh, Obama's EEO legacy? Well, the first thing that I would mention to you is nothing seems to be happening very quick. All right. Um, the president and his administration have been mired in a number of other issues, um, which has obviously been a distraction uh, from the business at hand. Uh, and so perhaps some of the key positions um, that would already have been filled um, had some of these distractions not taken place remain vacant. So much of the, the current administration's stamp, if you will, has yet to be left imprinted on the EEOC and the OFCCP. So um, with that, um, let's examine the Obama legacy. Right? So what, what occurred under the Obama administration? Well, what we saw was a, a rigorous strengthening of civil rights and steps to ensure equal employment opportunity. Um, and we saw that in three primary ways. First, we saw the expansion of employment-related regulations. And, and oh boy, were there a lot of regulations that came out, many of which uh, impacted the government contractor community exclusively, but several that were more broad uh, in terms of their impact as well. So we had the Fair Pay and Safe Workplaces Executive Order. Uh, we had the Minimum Wage Executive order. Uh, we had paid sick leave executive order. Uh, we had the tra pay transparency executive order. Uh, we had a number of steps taken to help ensure protections for LGBT rights. Um, we saw a requirement related to posting union rights. Um, and uh, we saw the EEOC and OFCCP ramp up their enforcement initiatives. So what you heard there is a whole lot of executive order 
discussion, right? And that's because Congress, um, which was controlled by a different party uh, during the Obama years, uh, for the majority of it, um, was certainly not going to get behind uh, legislative changes. Uh, and as a result, um, the president used the power of the purchasing uh, responsibility that the executive branch is responsible for issued executive orders, um, and that's where many of these regulatory changes came from. So that was the first way that they strengthened um, the civil rights and EEO um, protections out there. The second was with regard to enforcement. Um, both OFCCP, EEOC, and the Department of Justice for that matter were very, very rigorous uh, around the enforcement of the EEO laws, and all of them had systemic initiatives um, that they rolled out, updated, and were measured against uh, during those many years. Um, and then third, we saw a concerted effort to expand the protections of the various EEO laws. Um, some, some classic examples of that would be um, uh, sexual orientation under Title VII. So previously, um, the EEOC had not taken the position that sexual orientation was explicitly covered and protected by Title VII, but they switched gears under the Obama administration. And many of those cases that were brought actually are just starting to wind their way through the courts uh, at this point in time. Um, and we obviously expect that the Supreme Court is going to announce sort of a final determination as to whether or not that's protected under Title VII. Um, other examples would be uh, around um, enterprise-wide issues like pre-employment checks, uh, criminal backgrounds or credit and that sort of thing. Um, so what, what we saw was the government try to in expand the protections of the law through litigation as opposed to through legislative activity. All right, so that was the background leading into uh, the inauguration of the new president. Um, so we have the inauguration of the new president in January of this year, and now Republicans control the White House and both houses of Congress. Uh, and some would say that the conservative wing of the Supreme Court controls the Supreme Court. So you basically have a full house, um, if you will, or a straight flush, if you're a poker fan, uh, with uh, the Republicans in positions of power right now. So everybody is expecting, well, we're going to see a whole lot of rollback of regulations and we're going to see the creation of a more business-friendly environment, right? Um, that's what uh, one of the things that Trump ran on. Um, and frankly, that's what we were expecting. Um, but I will tell you, for those who really <laughs> predicted a quick death to these Obama-era employment regulations, may have been a little bit rushed. Uh, may have been a little bit premature. Um, sure, uh, the Fair uh, Pay and Safe Workplaces executive order has been rescinded. Um, that was essentially put on hold by the federal court system anyway. Um, so Congress just passed a law saying we disapprove, and then President Trump signed a countervailing executive order, and it's gone. But everything else that we discussed at the outset and that we're going to go through today, it's still on the books and still applicable. So as a consequence, uh, what we really need to start thinking about is, okay, are those regulations here to stay in their current or perhaps a modified form, or are they likely to go? All right, so that's what we're going to spend a fair amount of the remainder of the time that we have here today together uh, discussing. Okay, so let's talk about enforcement priorities. All right? So two different agencies we're going to focus on today are the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, and the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, or OFCCP. So if we start with the EEOC, uh, again, to pre present the historical context, we need to understand what was taking place before. And what was taking place before was that the EEOC was charged with tackling um, a number of areas related to equal employment opportunity, in particular as it related to systemic issues. Um, but that being said, there was also a clear mandate that the EEOC's job 
or focus should be to expand the protections of the law by taking on cases where the law may be unsettled or we thought it was settled, but there might be an opportunity, a fresh opportunity to expand those boundaries. Right? So the EEOC was charged with that effort. Um, two great examples I mentioned before were the systemic initiatives um, and the issue around LGBT protections. Um, however, we now see that uh, with a Republican president and Congress controlled by Republicans, um, the EOC's job may get a little bit more difficult um, because it wouldn't be surprising if their budget is reduced, um, thereby cutting off some of the resources that the agency would have had otherwise. Um, in terms of some things that have changed over at the agency in recent weeks, um, so we just recently had uh, a nominee for the head or the, the chair of the EEOC, um, and that is an attorney by the name of Janet Dillon. Prior to that, uh, we had an acting chair, uh, Victoria Lipnick. Um, both of them are Republicans. Um, and at least at present, um, we're just waiting for a couple terms to expire. Um, we have a balance of power actually in favor of Democrats, but that is very soon going to end. Um, and there is a vacant seat which will be filled potentially by uh, Victoria Lipnick now that um, Dylan has been nominated to uh, get the chair. And we don't see any reason, by the way, um, for, for Janet Dillon not to be approved by Congress. Um, she has management side experience both in-house as well as with, uh, with her uh, previous law firm. Um, she is um, a supporter of, of Republican uh, political candidates historically. Um, so she is going to be in all likelihood a pro-business leader of the EEOC. But the EEOC is a unique entity because the EEOC is made up of five members, right? And so each one of them has a vote with regard to uh, certain aspects of their enforcement initiatives. Um, so it's not as if she comes in and everything that was um, being undertaken under the previous administration disappears. Um, so, so what do we know the EEOC or expect that they're going to be doing over the next several years? We know this from their strategic enforcement plan, which is a four-year plan. Um, and it was initiated um, in 2017, early 2017. And many of the focal areas of this enforcement plan are the same that they've been historically. So eliminating barriers in recruiting and hiring, such as with pre-employment testing or checks. Protecting vulnerable workers, namely immigrants. Um, addressing emerging issues. Um, so a, a good example of emerging issues uh, is a discrimination on the basis of religion, for example, against Muslims or individuals from the Middle East. Um, ensuring equal pay is a big one, has been a big one, will continue to be a big one, uh, and more on that uh, in just a few moments. Uh, preserving access to the legal system. All right? So there has been a, a growing conflict, if you will, uh, amongst the employer and the employee communities, the civil rights communities, over access to court uh, in the form of lawsuits. Um, many employers like to use arbitration agreements, and some arbitration agreements prevent, for example, class actions. Um, and so the EEOC historically has looked at those types of agreements um, skeptically. And we may see some softening of that posture, but as a general rule, the EEOC is always going to want to make sure that individuals who are believed to have been aggrieved by their employers are going to have access to the legal system. Uh, and then finally, preventing uh, systemic harassment, uh, which according to uh, numerous reports, surveys, um, and evidence presented to the EEOC continues to be a problem. Um, so, if the, systemic, the, um, uh, the strategic enforcement plan appears to be unchanged from what was being utilized under the previous administration, what is going to change? Well, 
I think what we're going to see um, are two primary changes to the way the EEOC does business. Number one, we're going to see fewer regulations. Right? So we don't anticipate that EEOC is going to do a whole lot to create additional regulatory obligations for employers. If anything, they may revisit previously issued regulations um, and try to modify them to create a lesser burden for employers, or perhaps they might actually just get rid of certain regulations in their entirety. Um, but the other thing that we're expecting is a retreat from the notion that the EEOC should be litigating cases to expand the protections of the Equal Employment Opportunity laws. I think their, their approach will be we will strenuously and aggressively <clears throat> enforce the rules as they exist, right? So quite a literal interpretation of these laws, but we're not going to look for opportunities to expand them beyond the four corners of these laws. Very much in line with some of uh, the Supreme Court members' ideas on statutory enforcement. So that's what we're, we're looking for from the uh, EEOC. Let's switch gears now and talk about the OFCCP for a moment. Um, so the OFCCP um, has uh, a vacant directorship right now. Um, it falls under the U.S. Department of Labor, and therefore um, it, uh, it reports directly up to the Secretary of Labor, who currently is uh, Alex Acosta. Um, and at some point, we would expect the uh, appointment of a new OFCCP director. Um, but the OFCCP is going to have its hands full uh, in terms of shrinking resources, and as we'll talk about in just a moment, uh, potentially some reorganization. So first, um, whether it's Congress's draft budget, whether it's the President's draft budget, we are seeing a, an across-the-board budget cut for the Department of Labor. Um, and this is going to impact the OFCCP in, particularly, in particular uh, very harshly. Um, so first thing is we're going to see their resources cut significantly. Um, and that may have a significant impact on the way it conducts business. So for the last, oh, I don't know, seven years or so, since the previous OFCCP director, Pat Shu, had been appointed, OFCCP followed what they called their active case enforcement process. Active case enforcement was basically the internal playbook utilized by OFCCP in terms of how it conducted its compliance evaluation duties and responsibilities. Right? So OFCCP is responsible for conducting audits of federal government contractors and subcontractors to ensure that they are adhering to the various rules and regulations applicable to that set of employers. Uh, and it's, that's their principal means of enforcement. And it's very different, obviously, than what the EEOC does, which is primarily responds to charges of discrimination that walk in the door from complainants. OFCCP is out there affirmatively touching the government contractor community with these audits to ensure compliance. And this active case enforcement strategy utilized by OFCCP under Pat Shu was a in-depth analysis. In every instance where a compliance review or audit was initiated, initiated a full-blown review took place. And I would contrast that with what was done under the previous administration, under the Bush administration, whereby the agency again hampered somewhat by a smaller budget, approach things from an active case management standpoint. That was their terminology. And they did less thorough reviews, looking for clear indicators of noncompliance as opposed to digging and digging and digging in every particular review. And that allowed them to touch that many more government contractors um, where they found violations, they pursued them very aggressively, um, but they just didn't find as many per capita per se because they weren't looking that closely. Um, so some would argue that it was more effective because they touched more contractors and certainly more efficient given the resources that they had. The contrary argument is, well, who knows what you passed over because you didn't look closely enough. Bottom line is 
Um, we're expecting that the OFCCP is likely going to uh, take a step back, um, perhaps retreating to this idea of active case management, doing more with less. And I know that's cliche, um, but if they're facing um, budget cuts, uh, they're going to have to do more with less. Um, OFCCP has recently come under some fierce criticism also um, in terms of some of its enforcement methods, um, and that was highlighted in a General Accounting uh, Accountability Office um, report. Um, and so what we may see again is this idea of doing more with less and more collaboration between the OFCCP and the contractor or regulated community here. One of the things that uh, was pointed out um, in that critical report was that the OFCCP did away with a lot of its compliance assistance tools um, that um, they, were, they made available in the previous administration. So compliance coordination, offering awards that recognized employers who did a particularly good job with their compliance programs, um, all of that was done away with. Um, under Pat Shu. Uh, and so as a consequence, um, there was a feeling amongst the regulated community that the agency wasn't there to help them comply. So one of the things that we would anticipate um, under the new rebranded OFCCP whenever they get a new director is a resuscitation of efforts to cooperate, collaborate, and work collectively with the regulated community to help ensure compliance through voluntary compliance as opposed to uh, forcing employers to do things at the barrel of a gun uh, with the threat of violations or enforcement activity. Um, so, so that's a sense of, of where we see the OFCCP going. Um, now, we have to chat briefly about the concept of a merger between EEOC and OFCCP because it has been put on the table. All right. Now, where does this come from? Um, well, this idea comes from a white paper that goes all the way back to the Reagan years. Um, and it's a conservative think tank that every time a Republican administration uh, takes over the White House, um, basically says, there's no need for the two agencies, let's just collapse them into one, uh, and that will save lots and lots of money um, and do away with redundancy and red tape and, and uh, burden for the regulated community. Um, and so sure enough, um, this thing was resuscitated and trotted out, the dust blown off um, after the inauguration. And uh, folks in the Trump administration have seized on this uh, and, and actually floated it as part of their most recent budget proposal, the idea that the two agencies would be merged. Um, and the two agencies have been ordered, if you will, to look at um, how that could take place. Um, I will tell you a merger is unlikely, um, and it's for a few reasons. Number one, um, everyone except pretty much the author of that white paper um, who has heard about the idea of the merger has come out against it. Um, so strange be bedfellows have emerged. For example, the Chamber of Commerce um, the, and the NAACP both oppose this. All right? So if you've got pretty much everyone opposing it, including the regulated community, it's hard to think that the administration would force this uh, on the regulated community. But there's also a practical um, um, item that we need to consider here, and that is this merger cannot be done by executive fiat. And the reason for that is because the OFCCP, which enforces an executive order and two statutes, um, the, the, at least the two statutes come from Congress. And so as a consequence, it would require an act of Congress to revise which agency within the executive branch has enforcement authority. All right? So what we've seen, if we've seen anything over the last many years, is that Congress doesn't seem to like to tackle issues. Um, they do a lot of kicking the can down the road, um, and they've got a number of big ticket items, uh, obviously, that they want to get to, whether it's health care reform, whether it's tax reform, whether it's an infrastructure bill. I just don't see a whole lot of appetite 
for tackling the reorganizational needs um, of uh, the legislation that would be necessary here in order to create uh, a situation where the two entities could merge. Now, anything can happen. Um, so I'm not going to bury the idea completely. I'll just share with you that we believe it is unlikely to take place. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to change gears a little bit and we're going to talk about some specific issues um, that um, um, are, I guess if you call them the legacy of the Obama administration, at least from an EEO perspective. Um, and we'll talk about what we think is going to happen with those particular issues, um, specifically around regulations uh, or enforcement uh, approaches that we've seen uh, under the previous administration. So let's start with pay equity. And there's, there's quite a bit to unpack here. So we know uh, that pay equity was a big, big deal under the Obama administration. The very pers first piece of legislation signed by President Obama was a fair pay law, right? the Lilly Ledbetter Act. Um, we know that the White House uh, put together a pledge for public companies to essentially uh, ass uh, assert um, that they will ensure that there is no pay discrimination in their workplaces. Um, there were directives given to the EEO enforcement agencies to ensure that equal pay was a part of their enforcement strategies, uh, their enforcement priorities. So we know how Obama felt about pay equity. What about Trump? Well, we honestly don't know a whole lot. Um, Ivanka Trump, his daughter, um, who um, has been an advocate for the president on family and women-related issues, we know where she stands, um, and she very much believes in the idea of equal pay for equal work. Um, president Trump has said some things, but frankly, they're not terribly specific, um, and they don't indicate whether or not he would support continued equal pay enforcement efforts or something less than that. We, know, we don't know that he would support equal pay legislation that has been introduced uh, year after year in Congress. Um, so, so that's something that we, uh, we have to pay attention to. But for a lot of people, what this suggests is that, you know what? These equal pay initiatives may continue even under a Trump administration. All right, so let's unpack that a little bit further. OFCCP Directive 307. So when OFCCP was given the marching orders from President Obama to make equal pay a key component of its enforcement strategy, they issued an internal directive to all of the enforcement personnel at the agency, um, what we call Directive 307. And basically what it did is it rescinded old, what it called uh, restrictive guidelines um, and um, directions that the agency was supposed to follow when it came to identifying uh, and then remedying cases of pay discrimination, and essentially loosened the rules. Um, if you think about it, um, if, if you were a plumber and you only had one tool, a screwdriver, well, there's probably only so much you could do to fix plumbing situations. Um, Directive 307 essentially gave the plumber an entire toolbox and said, use whatever tool is necessary to get the job done. Um, so this really un, you know, shackled the agency um, and allowed them to pursue um, pay claims much more aggressively. Um, but it was frustrating to the contractor community because you never knew what the agency was going to be doing. You never knew what tool it was going to pull out of its toolbox. And one of the things that the agency began doing, um, again, much to the chagrin of the regulated community, is it moved away from looking at truly similarly situated individuals, people basically doing the same exact job, and started aggregating multiple jobs into pay analysis groups. And this was intended for two reasons. One, 
the power of large statistical data sets. Um, larger data sets tend to be more robust, um, and they have the added benefit of more often showing statistical significance when you're comparing pay rates by race and by gender. Um, so, so that was one benefit. The other benefit was um, it, it avoided a situation where employers tried to get into the weeds about individual pay decisions thus making it more difficult for employers to defend their pay practices. Um, all well and good if you, from the OFCCP's perspective, but very frustrating to the regulated community and, and critically contrary to Title VII case law. So this is a great example of where under the OFCCP or under the Trump administration, we don't expect the OFCCP to stop looking for issues of pay discrimination. But what we can anticipate reasonably is that they're not going to push the boundaries of the law. They're not going to try to bring claims that say people who are not really similarly situated can be compared together. Um, that comparable worth theory will probably be shelved once again, um, and the OFCCP will enforce things as the case law suggests that they should. Um, but that doesn't mean the regulated community is sort of off the hook there, um, because where the federal government has failed to act in recent years or been hamstrung in their actions, um, the states have set up to fill the void. Um, and there have been a rash of new and, and uh, updated equal pay laws at the state level, uh, California, New York, Maryland, Oregon, Massachusetts, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and these laws um, do a number of different things that we need to be cognizant of and pay attention to, uh, whether it's uh, pre-hire um, bans on inquiries into salary history, um, who can be compared to one another. So just as I was talking about where OFCCP is likely going to go back to similarly situated, um, the state laws seem to be allowing this comparable worth uh, type claim to be brought. Um, looking at the concept of total compensation as opposed to just base salary. Uh, the concept of pay transparency, not prohibiting employees from discussing their terms and conditions of work, at least as it relates to pay, uh, ensuring that employees who do that are not retaliated against, um, and then limiting the defenses available to employers um, and increasing the damages available, thus making these cases more attractive to plaintiff's attorneys. So where the federal government won't act, we see the states stepping into the void. Um, Next in our list of pay equity issues um, is the new EO1 report. Um, and this has caused a lot of frustration and consternation amongst the employer community. Um, so the EO1 report um, is required of all employers with 100 or more employees. Uh, that threshold drops down to 50 if you are a federal government contractor or subcontractor. But for that set with 100 or more employees, the EO1 report is being revamped. And it's being revamped to not only include your workforce demographics within each of the EEO1 categories, but you now need to provide information related to pay and hours worked. Um, the deadline for submitting the new EEO1 report has been pushed back to March 31 of every year, as opposed to its historical due date of September 30th. Um, and you'll basically take a picture of your workforce at some point in the fourth quarter of the year, and then you will report W-2 earnings for those individuals and hours worked, at least for purposes of classifying them into boxes. So you're not actually going to report on individuals' exact compensation. What you're going to do is based on the W-2 earnings tabulation that you have, um, you will put these individuals into boxes. Um, so EEO1 category 1.2 will no longer have one line of data. It will have 12 lines of data resulting from each of the bands that the government created, and you're just going to make sure your accounts reflect the number of white males, for example, who fall into a particular pay band. Um, and you'll also include hours worked. EEOC talks about 
um, the idea of publishing this data um, so that it can um, be used as a benchmark, which is one of the principal reasons that they claimed they wanted to revise the EON report. The other is being uh, to help the EEOC and OFCCP focus their enforcement efforts. Uh, and then what we think is the real reason why they are uh, requiring this new EON report, and that is um, so that uh, employers will actually self-evaluate. Right? So if you know you're going to be turning over this information to the government, um, you're more likely to perform a self-evaluation of your pay practices. So the question of course is, now that we have a new sheriff in town, this is going to go away, right? Well, not so fast. Uh, first off, the regulations that created this new report are final and effective. And they can't simply vanish. And the reason for that is there are laws regarding regulations. And whether regulations going into effect or regulations being pulled out of effect, they still need to go through a rulemaking process. Um, so they can't simply pull the plug on this. So, what is the likelihood that this thing is going to go forward? Well, right now it looks pretty good. But there are some possibilities here. Um, one is congressional action. right? So Congress could amend Title VII to do something um, that changes the EEO-1 reporting requirement. Uh, again, given the issues that they're trying to tackle uh, with this legislative session, uh, it seems like this is probably not a priority. Um, then there's the Office of Management and Budget. So OMB um, could, in theory, reverse its approval of the final regulation under the guise that um, the final regulations didn't appropriately consider the burden on the employers being required to submit the new report. Um, but that would be pretty broadly political. Um, and it would be difficult to, to see how that would be justified, and all the civil rights organizations, of course, would cry foul. But it is possible. Um, now, the EEOC could vote to reverse direction uh, and then go through the notice and rulemaking process um, that I mentioned before, but that would take time. Um, and there would need to be some justification for it. Otherwise, it might get mired in, uh, in court. Um, so right now, the, the people who um, we've spoken to um, have pretty much all prognosticated that this thing very likely will go through and be effective or continue to be effective so that March 31 we're all going to be filing this new EON report. Now that doesn't mean that it won't go away at some future point, um, but it's difficult to envision how that can get um, derailed between now and when it's due. Of course, we are monitoring the situation closely. Uh, and, uh, and we'll be providing updates through our blog service uh, if anything new uh, develops in that area. A critical takeaway from, from our discussion here today is, all right, well, what do I as an employer do then? Um, there seems to be some uncertainty around this, but Matt, you're saying that this is likely going to happen. Um, well, under those circumstances, what we've been telling our clients is, look, you need to test your systems. You need to make sure that you can produce the data that would be needed in order to complete the new report. If that test comes out positive and you can, great. Um, rest easy. And in the fourth quarter, do some, some further testing to get ready for your actual reporting. Um, if, however, your systems are unable to produce all or some component of what the new EEO-1 format requires, what we're recommending is talk to your systems people and find out how long it would take for them to complete any changes to the system to allow the reporting. And then based on how long they are saying that will take, that will give you sort of a drop dead date um, you know, after which you can no longer wait. 
Right? So let's say it's going to take your, your systems people two months to effectuate the reporting changes, and you know you need to run a report no later than December 31. Um, well, you know what? You probably want to make sure that you ask for this change by October, thus giving time uh, for those changes to be effectuated before you actually have to run live data. Um, in the meantime, you could wait to see what's going to happen and perhaps um, you know, the, um, one of the uh, items uh, or one of the ways that the report could be derailed would actually take place. All right? But if you don't think you have that kind of time, or uh, the systems um, are, are something that need to be updated immediately, then we're suggesting that you do just that and get them in process. Okay, also related to pay equity is pay transparency. I touched on this briefly with the state laws. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that um, an executive order was issued under the Obama administration or from President Obama basically saying, look, uh, government contractors, you cannot discriminate against or retaliate against employees or applicants uh, for discussing, asking about, or disclosing pay. Now, this is not really new because frankly um, this has been permitted for most employees in an employer's workforce for decades under the National Labor Relations Act. All right? uh, it's a term and, and condition of employment and employees are allowed to discuss that for collective purposes. Um, however, uh, there was a limitation to those protections um, in that they did not apply to supervisory personnel or applicants for employment. So this executive order expanded the applicability of those protections. Um, there are some uh, carve-outs, um, and, and they, they're listed here on the slide. Um, but importantly, the question is, of course, is this going to be rescinded? The answer is, it easily could be. This was an executive order. All President Trump needs to do is sign a countervailing executive order, and it goes away. But this isn't particularly controversial, and it's not really burdensome um, because it's just a protection. Now, right now the OFCCP's regulations on this require um, a posting. Uh, so perhaps the regulations get modified to eliminate the posting requirement. Um, but since this doesn't seem to be particularly controversial, there is a reasonable possibility that this is going to stay. All right, so all of those items were related to equal pay. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to turn to um, a couple items that are related, um, and that is paid, um, paid sick leave um, and minimum wage. And the reason we're going to sort of touch on these together is because of their applicability. So let's start with paid sick leave. So effective January 1 of 2017, for certain covered contracts, the requirement um, to offer paid sick leave to employees applies. All right? Now, what is um, you know, the type of leave? Um, it can be used for a lot of the same reasons you think about when you think about FMLA. So employees' own illness or health needs, um, family members, um, or uh, adding um, if they are victims or subject to domestic violence or abuse. Um, so basically employees would earn one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours work with a maximum of up to 56 hours. Um, and um, employees can carry over a maximum of 56 from year to year. They can never exceed the 56 unless of course you have a more generous policy. So for those contracts for which this requirement was applicable, that requirement went into effect January 1 of 2017. Many employers have ignored this, assuming that President Trump was just going to get rid of it. But guess what? It's still with us. All right? And there's a reasonable chance that it will continue to stay with us, at least for the time being, because Trump actually has made several statements in support of the idea of paid family leave, um, and his daughter um, is very much in favor of that as well. Now, 
traditional conservative Republicans probably not big fans of the idea of putting another regulatory burden on employers, especially in the form of a paid leave requirement. Um, but there's actually a, a um, some legislation out there that is pending um, in Congress which would provide just that. Now there's, there's a give and take here that we anticipate, um, but uh, there may be legislation that makes this executive order and the resulting regulations unnecessary. So for the time being, we probably expect this to stay in place uh, until some legislative activity takes place or if that legislation gets derailed or there doesn't seem to be any consensus about it, then what we may see is this regulation rescinded in its entirety or perhaps revamped to be a little bit more employer friendly. Now, this requirement has limited applicability in that it only applies to certain types of contracts. Specifically, contracts are subject to the Service Contract Act, contracts covered by the Davis-Bacon Act, construction, um, contracts for concessions, and contracts for use of federal lands. All right? So for the most part, if you're selling widgets to the government directly or indirectly, this is not going to apply to you. All right? So at least if you're covered by one of those four types of contracts and it was entered into, between January 1 of this year and the present, then that provision related to paid sick leave is going to be in there, and you're required to comply with it. Now, the minimum wage rule is similar and has been in effect for a lot longer period of time. It's been in effect since January 1 of 2015, with the minimum wage on covered contracts being $10.20 an hour. This requirement applies to the same types of contracts that the paid sick leave requirement applies to. All right? So Service Contract Act, Davis-Bacon Act, concession agreements, and contracts for the use of federal lands. Um, now, this looks like another great example of government you know, butting in and, and making business more difficult, especially for small and medium-sized businesses. However, this one's a little bit more difficult to rescind. Why? You think about it just in terms of, of practicality. Right? If you've got certain individuals who are making the minimum wage, are you going to start hiring new people in um, into those same jobs and paying them less? that's probably going to cause uh, an employee relations problem. Or even, even more drastic, are you going to take money away from these people? Are you going to reduce their rates of pay? Probably not. So the genie's already out of the bottle on this one. So chances are uh, we're going to see this um, stay as is. Uh, again, perhaps there would be some noodling around the edges um, whereby it becomes a bit more business friendly, maybe in terms of who this applies to, uh, or perhaps um, you know, the idea of when it changes. Right now it can be changed on an annual basis. Um, but there's a decent chance that this one is going to stay in place because it's already taken place. Folks are, employers are already paying people that minimum. Okay, and that brings us to the home stretch here, um, and that is um, LGBT rights. So um, during the Obama years, he issued an executive order, um, and that executive order applying to the federal government contract community prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and so that was the first time that any federal act actually protected these groups. Uh, and so all federal government contractors and subcontractors were now required to ensure that non-discrimination uh, was the norm when it came to these, uh, these individuals. Um, and so OFCCP was responsible for ensuring that that 
uh, took place, and employees uh, or applicants could file charges of discrimination with them um, if they believe that they were somehow discriminated against on the basis of their sexual orientation and or gender identity. Um, in addition, uh, the Obama administration through the Department of Education issued uh, what they called Dear Colleague Letters um, on transgender students specifically saying, look, if you want to ensure that you receive certain federal funding for your educational institutions, you need to make sure that transgender people, uh, students are protected um, so that they can basically use bathrooms uh, that ascribe to their gender identity. So what are we expecting under Trump? Well, one of the early policy debates within the administration was just over this issue. Is this executive order going to be rescinded? or is it going to stay in place? Certain factions uh, within the administration were very much about rescinding this, not because of government overreach, but because philosophically they were opposed to the idea of protecting individuals of this type of background. Um, and then there were more progressive voices, uh, including um, the President's daughter uh, and Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos, uh, who actually said, no, don't do that leave it in place. Um, and so there was a, a statement made by President Trump that, you know what, we're going to leave that executive order in place, certainly for now. Um, so, so that executive order is safe along with its implementing regulations. However, it's not the end of the story um, because those dear colleague letters were actually rescinded or superseded by a further uh, dear colleague letter that went out, which basically said, uh, look, um, you're not going to jeopardize federal funds if you decide not to grant bathroom access, for example, to transgender students. Um, what We're going to let you as an institution in your state decide this for yourselves. Um, we also saw that um, President Trump signed an executive order which was somewhat vague, but essentially what it did is it charged the Department of Justice with looking at instances where the federal government, in its opinion, um, was in some way, shape, or form interfering with religious liberty. So, you know, the, I think the classic example might be, uh, right, the, the wedding cake for a gay couple. Um, if an employer decides it doesn't want to contract with that couple for purposes of procuring the cake, um, should they be entitled to do that, even though in likelihood that violates federal and state and local non-discrimination laws. Um, and so the Department of Justice is currently weighing the idea um, or the concept of when do non-discrimination laws get trumped, excuse the pun, uh, by the freedom to exercise religion. Um, and so we expect that there will be some curtailment of the federal government going after employers for violating non-discrimination laws um, in the name of religious liberty. All right. Um, so that brings our presentation to a conclusion. Um, Here's information on how to contact me um, if you do have questions that you want to talk about that we don't get to today. Um, I would also um, recommend, if you're so inclined, to sign up for our blog. It's a free service, um, and it's a great way to stay abreast of developments uh, in all of these areas. All right. Um, with that, Rathin, if you want to bring us home before we do our Q&A. Sure. Um, thank you again, uh, Matt, uh, from all of us here. Uh, I thought it was a great uh, presentation, insightful, thoughtful, and interesting. Uh, so once again, many thanks. Uh, now before we move on the Q&A, and I don't know how much time we'll have for Q&A, uh, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about you know, Job Finder Network and how it helps our users with their EEO web specific compliance and Internet recruitment. Uh, so most of you may not know that before launching Job Finder, I also started another company called America's Job Exchange, and we give uh, similar services. Uh, but it is definitely a next generation uh, platform that we built 
with input from a lot of uh, HR and uh, recruiter uh, uh, recruiting professionals. And it's really an all-inclusive internet recruitment solution for compliance. Uh, it does uh, job postings automatically from your career site uh, on specialized job boards. It does a job posting and distribution to all the state job boards, the EESDS, the Employment Service Delivery System, uh, more than about 6,500 diversity organizations, and so on. And finally, uh, we believe that we have created a truly next generation compliance reporting uh, that has comprehensive reporting of screenshots, of postings, distribution, uh, and everything else. Uh, and so that you can keep them and just forget about it. And if there is an audit, obviously you can retrieve uh, all that information. Again, you know, the purpose of this uh, webinar was, uh, and again, thanks to Matt, is more educational than to really talk about our companies or our firms. Uh, so uh, I would stop there. And obviously, uh, you can uh, read more about us. Uh, you can, you know, give a demo, or you can, you know, send your questions or any kind of feedback uh, to me or to Matt. Now, I'm trying to figure out if we have any time for questions and fundamentally how to, in fact, take questions. So let me go back to another uh, system. You can give a chat. Uh, you can submit your presentations, and or we can obviously go back. Uh, and, and send emails directly uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Matt or myself. Uh, anything, uh, should we continue or should we, uh, I'll take any questions. Anybody has any questions? Let me see if I can move to a different format here. Uh, let me see how that can be done. Okay. Uh, so I uh, do not know uh, if we can do really a proper uh, presentation right now. So why don't, uh, I mean, Q&A session right now. So may I suggest uh, everybody to send uh, the questions, and I would hand over them to Matt uh, for the sake of uh, time and, and so on. So that way we can... Uh, Mm, we can address them properly instead of, you know, in a rush. Uh, and um, we would, we have recorded the session. We would also share the presentation with you. And uh, there also I will send uh, mm, the information to contact Matt or to send uh, me uh, questions. I wanted to end the webinar because quite a few people are dropping off right now. And I want to make sure that everybody uh, gets an opportunity to to continue. Is that all right with you, Matt? Absolutely. If, uh, if you send me your, uh, your question, I'll be sure to answer them. Yeah, sure. So thank you everyone again for making time for us uh, this afternoon or morning, depending on where you live. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate it, and there will be uh, more uh, such uh, webinars going forward. So stay tuned, and uh, we will also be in touch. Thank you very much once again. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye.